Hi, everyone. I think we're decent amount, so we can start. Uh, I'm sitting here uh, with this, but I think we'll start the introductions. Yeah, super. So, um, <clears throat> well, thank you all for uh, taking the time and uh, welcome. Um, so uh, today's host is going to be uh, Aslak and, and I, and uh, the purpose uh, is to to give you a better understanding of, of the loop and, and provide a Q&A session uh, about it and for you to ask questions. Um, so since there are uh, some new faces, then we'll just do a brief uh, introduction of from Hank Atomics in the loop. And after that, there will be a, uh, hopefully an interactive uh, session uh, where you can ask questions. And uh, feel free to, um, uh, write your questions in the chat uh, uh, section, and uh, after the at the live session, of course, you can also just uh, provide uh, your questions uh, after the presentation. Um, so, um, with that said, uh, I'll hand it over to Eslan. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, the loops that we built here in Coding Atomics and and some of our experiences, and then as uh, Jesper said, please uh, ask questions. Uh, and write in the chat also if you have problems with audio or anything. Uh, but let's jump into it. Uh, so Coming Atomics was founded six years ago uh, with the idea of building molten salt reactors on an assembly line. Uh, and we've been on a long journey and, and we're a grown team. And um, we just rounded uh, 30 employees and um, we're actually hiring around 50 people the next year. Um, I also put some of the open positions here. So if you know someone who's a molten salt tinkerer uh, and who would like to move to Denmark to be part of this team, uh, let them know so they can contact us via our website. There's more information there. Um, so the approach that Code Making has taken to building uh, molten salt reactors on an assembly line is a little bit different to how it's normally done in the nuclear industry, because uh, traditionally you have the approach of um, doing a, what we call a paper design. So you basically design a whole reactor and then you try to get it approved. And then you build it and, and operate it and see if everything works. And then you'll eventually try to build more of them. Uh, but since molten salt reactors is a fairly new technology, proven, but still very new, uh, we saw in Code Making Atomics that the need was more on the development side of all the components and integration and software and uh, electronics. So we chose a little bit different route where we um, tested and built components and learned from the failures and iterated on the science without working with anything uh, like radioactive salts uh, or, or a, anything that's uh, critical. Um, because that means that we can develop and test things at a much lower price because these reactors are basically um, red hot uh, stainless steel that's pumping salt around in a loop. Um, and so the components are not necessarily very expensive. And this is also what lends uh, the reactor to be uh, made small and modular and to be made on an assembly line. And so now we're sort of in this process where we tested most of the components that goes into a reactor and we're trying to integrate them to what we call a non-fission prototype. Um, and this is something we're doing the next two years and, and we have it sort of roughly here on a timeline um, where the goal is then to build a roughly one megawatt demonstration reactor by 2025. And only at that point will we then uh, finalize the design that we would like to have in a production uh, commercial reactor. Because we know that through this process, we'll have a lot of learnings and a lot of failures that we can learn from and, and better the design, both from a safety, uh, but also from cost and uh, manufacturability. Um, and this is what has lent us to build uh, loops. Um, and this is not a sort of new approach. Uh, back in Oak Ridge in the 70s and 60s and, and even 50s before that, when they were building these uh, molten salt reactors and, and testing them out, they also had lots of loop experience and, and different kind of uh, component experience before they ever built a reactor. And which makes sense, of course, because you learn from those failures. And, and they didn't just have a few loops, they had dozens and dozens of loop. And I just added a few pictures here to sort of show the scale uh, of the testing. Um, and you can sort of see down here, if you can see my cursor, all the data acquisition and electronics were, of course, a bit different back then and all the cabling here. Uh, it takes up a lot of space, um, but it's the same approach we've done in Code Megatomics. We just managed to uh, uh, compact things a lot more 
Here you see our manufacturing space. So we're co-located uh, with Alpha Laval in, in Denmark. Alpha Laval is uh, one of the world's largest manufacturer of heat exchangers. Uh, and we've moved into their factory facilities there. And we've uh, built out a, a lot of uh, these loops here. Um, I think we're rounding around 10 loops now, and we plan to build roughly 20, 40 more in the next year of this version. We've had many iterations before we, we gone through this design. Um, and I'll go through also how, like more detailed in the design. Um, but this loop more or less has the same capabilities that the loops you saw before. It's just compacted a lot more. And this is also because we're practicing building reactors basically. And, and our goal is to build a, a reactor in a vessel the size of a 40 foot shipping container. So this is sort of a smaller version of this, but it, it has all the same components that you need to run a one megawatt demonstration reactor. It just, just doesn't have the volume to have a core that can become critical, but uh, that's not necessary for what we're using this for. I also included some pictures on the, uh, here on the left of the, the static salt tube testing equipment that we're doing. We also got approvals to start testing with the uh, uh, thorium and, and natural uranium salts. Uh, so these uh, test tubes, as we call them, uh, are intended to paralyze the, the testing of gaskets and, and corrosion in, uh, in fertile salts. And, and this is sort of the key point here. If by having multiple um, loops uh, running the same test or variations of the same test, you're able to get a lot more data out. So you can get ideas of mean time between failure before you ever start a reactor. It would of course be um, uh, not nice to have a reactor you build and approve. And then after you test it for a few years and you start building more, then you find that there's a mean time between failure that's just a little bit longer than uh, what you tested your first reactor for. And as you start to build out your fleet of reactors, you have to recall them, uh, which is of course very difficult when you're working with nuclear and especially the nuclear materials that's gonna be involved. So this is why we wanna have components that are not only tested by themselves, but also the integration is tested for a long time, many hours of testing. And because we have a uh, tight uh, timeline for building reactors, we of course need to test in parallel. So this is why we had to develop the loops. Um, and um, we're, so we sort of expanded our manufacturing space to build these loop here because we, we have a lot of sub suppliers for the components that goes into them, a lot of custom parts also. But we do all the manufacturing and integration and testing at our facility in Copenhagen. Um, and everything from uh, machining and uh, laser welding, uh, and also all the salt manufacturing that goes into these loops. Um, so this is also one of the things where many years ago when we started building loops, we were looking for suppliers. And initially we just uh, loaded in uh, powder and, and tested loops that way. But the thing is that the, all the salt suppliers always deliver the, the salts with a little bit of oxides, uh, metal impurities, uh, a few other impurities, but particularly moisture impurities. And so they cause corrosion whenever you start a loop. Uh, and we couldn't find anyone who could deliver clean salts. So we had to sort of develop our own process for purifying uh, salts. We mainly use Fleenac, but we can also use other types. And we have different grades, but our most um, used grade of uh, Fleenac is this uh, loop grade, we call it. Uh, and that's because you can sort of, you can get an, an arbitrary amount of uh, purity of your salt, but you have to ask like, at what cost and for what test are you trying to do? So if you're running a loop for a couple of months, you don't necessarily need to have 10 ppm of impurities uh, and something like 100 ppm is more than fine for most test purposes. Uh, and this is uh, why we sort of uh, have a loop grade that is a little bit lower grade than, than what you maybe have in a reactor, but it's, it's perfectly fine for a loop. And we try to keep this um, below 100 ppm. Um, and we're, we're pretty excited about scaling our production. So we're we're rounding around the 100 kilos per month of uh, flea production this summer. And we plan to scale that by an order of magnitude within the next year. This is all sort of training to build uh, reactors and but also have the supply uh, structure for the salts. So it's the intent to uh, move to uh, fertile salts and, and, uh, and later fuel salts with similar quantities um, because we need to build thousands of reactors and that, that requires a lot of salt. Um, we can also do other chlorides and nitrate salts, but uh, Fleenag is our primary uh, used one. Um, 
So sort of jumping into the loop here, uh, we've had many generations and this is now our fifth generations. And the one I'm showing here is our newest third iterations. And every time we're refining smaller and smaller things, but we're pretty happy with this overall design. Um, uh, some basic statistics here, like it's roughly 22 of max, uh, kilowatts of max power, and that's mainly the heating. Uh, we standard, uh, standardly, we sell it for like three phase European voltages, but it can also run on other voltages. Uh, the size of it is made to be the same as a Euro pallet. So you can take a forklift and you can just pick it up as long as you've disconnected power and gas and you can just roll it through a standard door and get it into a lab and, and you can have many of these in a, in a row and test them at the same time. Um, the maximum temperature of the furnace is around 750. Um, the pump that we normally fit these with has a flow rate roughly of 400 uh, liters per minute uh, maximum. And to put that into perspective, if that was uh, 100 degrees C you pulled out of a fuel salt, that would be roughly four megawatts of thermal energy that the pump can transport. Um, the minimum flow standard is around 40 liters, but we can do some modifications to get it lower than that. Uh, the total uh, or maximum salt load is around 80 liters, but we normally only have 20, 25 liters of salt in it. Um, and we normally use a um, inert atmosphere of argon, just normal welding gas argon, but it could of course be high purity or um, uh, helium gas. Um, and it takes like half, half a day to, uh, from you start the system and you've loaded everything to heat it up. Uh, to a molten temperature. It also depends on the salt and, and how high of a temperature you're operating at. Um, and of course, it also takes half a day for then it to cool down, sometimes even a bit more because it's, it's an insulated system. And the whole thing weighs about a ton, depending upon the configuration. Um, so if we look sort of inside here um, and start sort of over here to the left. So on one side, we have um, all the electronics uh, and on the other side, we have the furnace. And the idea of this setup is that everything is contained inside of a double layer of uh, containment with inert atmosphere. So the whole box here is uh, leak tight and it then has an inert atmosphere uh, and it's sealed by these panels. Um, and the bottom here is uh, welded tight so that if salt for some reason spills out, it is still contained. The idea there being that if you have a leakage of salt, it should still be inside an inert atmosphere as to not react with anything. Uh, if we look inside the furnace here, the insulation is not shown here, but we see the heating elements, we see gas connections, helium element again. Then we have the main salt tank uh, and the pump. And of course, many different types of uh, configurations can be mounted in here, but we're not showing any of them right here. Uh, there's then a frame around this and that's mainly if you have a pipe break and you spill out a lot of salt at once. Uh, thankfully, we've not had that failure yet. But in that case, then there's a frame to protect the insulation from splashing salts uh, because the um, insulation is oxide based. So we don't want to have the salt react with that. But so the overall uh, configuration basically allow us to have a very compact salt flowing system in here, which is the primary part of the loop uh, where we pump the salt around. And, and have that um, contained inside of a furnace so we don't need trace heating on, on all the pipes. The whole inside volume here can be heated to 750C. And, and it can then be opened here on the, on the exploder view. You see how the panels can be taken off and, and the insulation panel that's not shown can be taken off. And then we can access the volume of the furnace to replace a component, pull out samples, uh, whether it be coupons or or a heat exchanger uh, that we're testing corrosion in or, or fatigue. Um, we can basically open it up and split, uh, take out a component within a few hours and, and put everything back together. Uh, if it's a simple operation, you can just do it within a minute and you, you bolt it back on, you do a leak test, and then you start it back up. Um, and the reason that we have the control system contained inside of this inert gas is because that allows us to easily modify any penetrations that's going from the control system to the furnace. So those things might be thermocouples, uh, gas lines. Um, it could be uh, leak detection sensors. Uh, of course, the heating elements you see here um, or any other device you wanna sort of configure to go from inside the furnace to the control part. 
And none of these penetrations have to be leak tight because it's all inside the inert atmosphere. The only thing we have to do is we have to control, uh, cool this uh, control uh, part here. So that's why there's an air condition on top that just cools all the electronic components. And of course it's uh, thermally insulated from the furnace. Um, and so this minimizes the amount of different leak paths that you can have. Um, and in this configuration that's shown here on the front panel, there's a plexiglass window with uh, two holes for cloth boxes, or sorry, cloth box uh, gloves that are not drawn in here. But that means that in this particular configuration, you can even put your hand in and you can modify something in the electronics or uh, have a manual valve, or whatever it might be. Uh, but normally there's just a plate there. So you, you don't have access to it. Um, and then at the bottom here, you have uh, uh, all the power and gas systems. Uh, the outside of the loop is fitted with a scrubber. So both of the inert gases are going through a scrubber. Um, that's sort of making sure that if you had some kind of accident that there's no contamination that can possibly leak out uh, of either the first or the second barrier. Um, uh, if we then go and look here, the, the electronic system, it's basically everything is contained inside this, uh, this uh, loop unit. So that means that it, the only thing it requires is power and a Wi-Fi connection and a gas connection. Uh, but all the controls and measurements and, and uh, systems that we need to operate the loop is inside this box. Um, and it's all being locked and sent to a secure cloud uh, server where we, uh, a person can then log in and view all the data that's streamed from the loop. And uh, it also fitted with a backup power supply. So even if the power runs out, it can still operate and it can also still upload data and, and or buffer the data if uh, the internet connection is lost. Uh, and some of the things that we're locking would be the state of the whole loop, um, temperature, pressures, oxygen and humidity of both atmospheres, um, uh, gas flow rates, uh, vibrations of components or pumps, for example, uh, the currents of every single heating element or any component that's fitted to it. Uh, we're also testing multiple places inside the, the furnace for salt leakage so that if there is a leak, we, we know it instantly and shut it down. Um, and the whole loop is then uh, controlled by software. So there's not an active operator that, that has to sit there and control it. It's all done in software. Of course, you can manually type in operations to it and, and commands, uh, but more or less the idea is that we program up a script for the particular test that we want to run. And then we have a bunch of conditional uh, states where if, for example, a leak happens or if some anomaly happens, then it knows to either shut down, turn off heating or, or do some other thing. Um, and, and that's sort of a practice for us to build reactors that are uh, autonomously operated, but it also allows us to have many of these loops running in parallel and, and basically just one person supervising them um, and, and even running overnight unsupervised, uh, dependent upon what test you're running. Um, and, and to sort of jump to the internal volume here, that's the main idea for us. Uh, one of the primary reasons we, we made these loops is to develop components and, and the pump is one of our primary examples of that. We've made this uh, canned rotor pump that doesn't have a, a long shaft like you traditionally have in, in molten salt systems. Uh, and that means that there's no dynamic seal. It's just a welded together system. So the likelihood of uh, salt leakage or vapors getting out of a dynamic seal is completely removed. Um, and we've used these loop for, for years now to sort of develop this pump, which is a radically different way of making a molten salt pump. Um, but this allows also a much more compact system. So together with the pump in there, we can fit it with the heat exchangers, like you see here on the other picture is uh, Alpha Laval's uh, plate heat exchangers that's all stainless steel. So they can tolerate fluoride or chloride salts. And these are the ones that we actually intend to use in our, in our reactors. We also have flow meters and uh, salt valves, uh, salt filters that we can fit inside this uh, furnace and, and test them either independently or together. And also the hydraulics of uh, multiple piping systems sort of seeing where flow goes and, and, and testing out different things. And so the typical um, uh, test for a loop like this is um, after it will run its previous test, open it up and, and inspect a component or the system, maybe pull it out and do modifications. Or if it's a simple modification, you can even do it while you're just working 
from the side into the furnace um, and then close it back up and, and restart it. Uh, and, and everything is then sort of placed in this volume here. Uh, and of course the salt tank could be um, a different size. We also have some systems where there's multiple salt, uh, salt tanks and we pump the salt from one to the other. We can also have the external piping. So from one of the side panels, basically uh, from the pump and up having a pipe connection that goes out of the loop that then allows someone to connect a component or a system to the exterior of the loop um, and, and have a thing out there that's tested. And in that case, when you start the loop, you do uh, all the heating procedures automated and, and maybe even including the priming procedure. Um, and then you can test for a couple of days or weeks or even a month or more, um, and then remove the component or switch it out with something else. Uh, but the design goal of this loop is that we can start testing it with the fertile salts. Uh, so thorium or uranium bearing salts and we are also sort of looking at testing these with fuel salts, but of course, no criticality, just testing the integration of the whole system um, with, the, with the fuel salt and, and having the correct corrosion behavior. And maybe even adding um, stable uh, fission product compounds. So equivalent to what the fission product distribution would be, but just from stable isotopes to the salt and be able to study uh, everything but the um, irradiation mechanics. And we've also looked at piping the, uh, taking the piping outside loop and then into a beam line and, and actually testing uh, radiation uh, driven uh, phenomena in a flowing uh, pipe at, at high flow rates. Um, so those are some of the things that we've thought about doing with the loops and, and that is possible with a system like this. Um, so yeah, I think I'll uh, turn it over to Jesper here. Yeah, so um, so basically now we would uh, open up for uh, uh, Q and A's. Uh, any any questions uh, you may have, uh, this is an option to to kind of ping pong on that. And I guess also um, what we uh, very much encourage is uh, industry collaboration. Um, so so basically um, uh, we are very open to. Um, uh, exploring uh, avenues and, and to basically advance this whole uh, industry together. So see, we have some questions uh, coming in now. Uh, oh, I guess. So I guess the first question here is, uh, how do you charge the salt? Charge the salt yeah, I think the loading. Yeah, so um, if we jump back here to, uh, Normally we, we load the, the tanks that are sitting inside here in a glove box just to minimize any contamination. But when the salt is uh, an ingot like it is here in the picture, that also minimizes the surface area. So instead of having a salt with a giant surface area that can readily absorb moisture from the air, uh, when you have it like ingots um, in one kilo sizes like this, you can actually load them inside of a tank in air and, and if you have a tank, you can even have a small feed of argon or helium, uh, but best if it's argon because it's heavier than air, you can have that in the tank and then you can sort of put it in. So they come in vacuum sealed bags and you just rip one open and you load it in. The, that uh, few seconds where the bar is exposed to air would not absorb any significant amount of corrosion. It's in the low PPM levels, even if it's four minutes. So I guess the next question is about uh, the cleanness of the salt oxides and containments. And the question is, uh, how are you testing the cleanness of the salts before using them? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question because uh, that's something that, that we've had trouble with uh, figuring out. And we also know that a lot of other people have had issues with how to measure uh, contaminations uh, accurately. And that's also why we sort of put a range on it because not only is there uncertainties in the measurement, but there's also uncertainties in the in the each batch, and we don't test every single ingot individually. We test each batch. Um, but uh, the the method we've had the most success with is um, using voltammetry and then calibrating uh, from pure salts and adding oxides, and then making a calibration uh, from which we can measure. But I would say that the the accuracy is maybe in the fifty ppm range. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. But again, the idea of these loop grade salts is also that it doesn't have to be perfect. It's not for doing uh, thermophysical measurements. Uh, when you're doing 
uh, pumping loop uh, with like 30 or liters of salt. You just want to minimize corrosion to the point where you can get the results you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. So next question, um, how to purge the enclosure uh, to get inert, inert gas atmosphere inside after reopening? Yeah, so um, when you open up the loop, uh, you do it after it's allowed to cool down. And there's even like a message that it's, it's cold enough. Um, and then you take the system out. And if you're just uh, removing a component, again, the amount of uh, the amount of contaminations uh, you'll introduce is minimal. You just uh, untighten that particular frame and pull out the component. The way it's constructed, all the salt drains passively when the pump is shut off to the bottom tank. So you only have a minimal amount of salt uh, on the inside where it surfaces. Um, and there's different ways of doing it, but you can even have a, a small gas flow into the piping system. So while you're removing a component, it still has a small perch on it. Um, but um, no matter how you, you sort of do it, when you load the system back in, um, you close up the walls and then the, the automated procedure sort of purchase both gas volumes until they reach a particular level that can be set sort of as a parameter. So that could be, for example, when the, the moisture, uh, humidity, and, and oxygen level is below what the sensors can read. And then only then do you start to heat the system up. Uh, I don't know if that answered the full question. But it's, yeah, they can ask again. Otherwise, we can jump to the next. OK. So uh, the next question is, um, have you designed online purification units, or is it planned? Um, yeah, so for I, I'm assuming this means for the reactor. Uh, we, we don't have any plans of having online purification extensively, at least wet chemistry on our first reactors. Uh, our idea is more to make a sort of minimal viable product uh, and test out and gain experience. Um, also because we expect there to be some regula uh, regulatory hurdles to jump through if you have online reprocessing. What we do plan to implement in commercial reactors is this uh, idea of vacuum spraying. So that's that uh, a large amount of the salt upon leaving the core, uh, goes through nozzles and is sprayed into a, a chamber where you separate the gas out. So you allow as much of the volatile fission products to evaporate away. Uh, and then it goes through a scrubber system. And so it's recirculated hot. You don't do any cryo distilling on it or anything like that. And we think that we can actually extract a fair amount of the fission products this way, uh, not just uh, xenon, but also some of the volatile uh, fission products. Also because many of the fission products while decaying uh, towards the line of stability, they go through multiple volatile compounds. So if you can catch them in those split seconds or, or minutes that they're volatile, you can then pull them out of the system. Uh, so that's at least where we'll start, but it's not something we've, um, we haven't developed online purification like you see in, in Oak Ridge documents. Okay. So next question here is, um, have you performed any lips or electrothermic uh, or chemical measurement in the salt loop as it is operating? I'd be interested in how the convection movement salt can affect these measurements. Yeah. Um, no, we haven't done any lips of voltammetry uh, in the loops. We, we plan to um, make some sort of setup to uh, get voltammetry inside the loop. And, and we have some ideas of that, but it's not a high priority for us. So maybe that's something that uh, could be collaborated on. If you have a, um, a, a voltammetry cell that you think could be exposed to a salt, so not that it's just, you can easily put it in, of course, in the salt tank because the top of that is not exposed to the salt. So it can reach down, but we're interested in one that sits in the pipe section. So if you have a design for that, then, uh, then let us know. Uh, in terms of lips, no, we've not implemented that in a loop. Um, this is something that we would like to do in the future, but it's uh, it's simply not something we've had time for yet. Okay. Yeah. So here we have a question about the pump. Uh, the pump must uh, must have been required due to small size. Would a larger unit be able to use thermal cycling and thus no pumping? If not, is this due to the viscosity? Um, so let me see this. Um... So the idea of the pump being small, the primary purpose of that is because it's a canned rotor pump. So the rotor and impeller is one assembly that's inside of a can. Um, so the primary purpose is not necessarily to make it small. 
Um, and what we're starting development on is um, a electromagnetic bearing version of the pump. So where the rotor and uh, impeller is levitating on an electromagnetic field. So there's no wearing surfaces. And we'll still make that one initially in the same size because that's uh, good enough for our one megawatt demonstration reactor. But we do have plans for the commercial reactor to scale it up to the roughly 25 to 50 megawatt thermal moving capacity. Um, so that would be without redundancy, two to four pumps for one of our reactors. And then the second part, uh, using thermal cycling and thus no pump. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what is meant here. I don't know if you mean met natural circulation, uh, in, in which case the flow rates would be way too low. You would have a way too large uh, fissile fuel inventory to just allow for the extraction of energy. Um, uh, yeah, I, the person can ask again, David, <laughs> if, uh, if okay. I didn't answer. Okay, then there's another question on, um, is there a decommission plan for these units? Specifically, what will happen to the components uh, and salt at their end of life, assuming using fertile salts? Yeah, so um, when, when using fertile salt, it's actually not too bad because um, any residue that's left on the component can be washed off and then separated for decommissioning or, or even reuse. Um, and, and the amount of contaminant you have on sort of, if you have corrosion and you have material penetrating into the pores, the amount that would be left from a washing is still fairly minimal. So you can actually expose of these by standard means. Uh, it becomes more of an issue uh, with the fissile salt because you have accounting for the material. Um, but we plan to use a similar approach of the, after the loop is done running, basically taking apart and washing everything thoroughly uh, and checking for contamination and only when it's below allowable limit, uh, sort of disposing of it. And then the salt has to sort of go in a separate steam stream. Maybe you evaporate it in and so you get a minimal amount of, uh, of uh, contaminated liquid. But any ideas out there is also welcome if you have uh, better ways to do it. So there's another question here. Um, <clears throat> do you require the loop to be flushed with salt in order to remove oxides uh, that are present in the loop before beginning standard operation? Um, no. So normally we, we wash the components uh, before installing them um, and, and then we uh, heat it up and dry it out. So you only have uh, oxide contamination uh, to the extent that it's on the stainless steel when you start. And of course you will have some oxide on the surface but again, for the purposes that, that we are using the loop, and I think many other people could potentially use loop for, it's simply not of, a, of a high importance. Uh, if there was for some reason was a requirement to have very low oxide contamination, you could flush it with sort of a one batch of salt and then remove that salt and then put in a fresh batch of salt. Um, another method is simply just to do electropurification on the salt while you're pumping so that you're removing any uh, buildup of contamination from the metal oxide surface. Yeah. So there's a kind of perhaps a related question here. Do you flush loop with salt before loading target salt into the loop? No, yeah, I think, yeah, <laughs> I think that we was answered. the same kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what is the expected life duration of the loop at 750C? Yeah, so we, we don't actually operate the loop normally at 750. That's the source, like the maximum that we've tested it to. I, I suspect it would go higher, but at some point you, you may start losing heating elements. Uh, but as you can actually see in the picture here, the, if you pull out the, the front panel, you can also just change the heating element without having to change out the sides, even though that's uh, rarely been the, the, the case. Um, and oh, so back to the duration. Well, it depends. So the whole loop has a, a fairly long lifetime, but individual components inside may have a shorter lifetime depending on design, of course. Uh, and that varies a lot. And uh, that's often what you want to try and improve. So you can have a component fail, like even before you started uh, pumping salt for, for some reason, uh, a short circuit or um, uh, like a misplacement. You can have a, a gasket leak uh, because of a misalignment upon installation. Um, so we have a lot of different tests to sort of uh, weed out if there's some sort of, for example, leakage between the salt barrier and the, and the, uh, and the loop volume. Um, and most component, depending upon what it is, it of course varies a lot. 
can have anywhere from hours to uh, months of uh, operation time. Something like the tanks uh, also have, you know, we, we don't know how long they have because they haven't failed yet. Um, uh, but for example, the pump in the beginning, we had a uh, short li lifetime on those and we changed. Uh, tested many different configurations. And that's some of the things that we're like improving, you know, you go from uh, days to weeks and, and to months of, um, of operation. Uh, yeah. If you have specific questions of components, we can also answer them. So, um, so there is another question here. Uh, how long will the fuel last per cycle? What are its maintenance cycle times for major components? Yeah, I guess that's sort of related. Um, it depends on what you're doing. Like if you're running the loop at 750C, the lifetime will definitely be shorter or the component life will be shorter if you're running at you know 500C. It depends on, on the individual components. In terms of maintenance, uh, normally when we, we have customers that, that use these loops, we within a, some a period agreed upon, we change out any component that fails because it is sort of a product in, uh, in, um, in development and, and sometimes we figure out way better solutions to do something. So we, we say, okay, let's switch this valve out to this newer valve because it, it performs much better or simply the operation is easier. So yeah, it, it depends again, but uh, expect if you're operating a system like this for things to fail once in a while, definitely. So I guess we could uh, join these next two questions. So uh, are you considering performance or corrosion studies with your loops? And do you observe an increase of impurities content in the salt after testing? Um, yeah, so we don't do any sort of fine uh, studies of corrosion. Uh, we do sort of um, like more um, like rough studies uh, of like either visual inspection or taking out and, and making slices and viewing in a microscope. Uh, but the primary purpose for us when we use these loops is to test components and, and test systems and integration. Um, and we have, uh, as I showed in one of the other pictures, um, we have these uh, test tubes here where there's a pipe inside of an inert atmosphere. That's the big pipe. And then we have smaller pipe inside and a gasket where we, we test corrosion. Um, so this is sort of uh, the setup that we use for corrosion testing. But again, if, if you wanted to test corrosion in a pump loop, there, there's no reason why you couldn't do it with a system like this. Uh, and yeah, we do see when often when we we load the salt and we start it up, we have an initial corrosion that sort of increases the impurities in the salt. And, and that depends on what the material you're using and it depends on the purity of the salt. Okay, so I think we'll, we'll take the last question now and then we will start wrapping just in respect for everybody's time here. Yeah. So uh, last question is, uh, what steel are you using? Oh, yeah, so we use um, stainless steel 316 for almost everything that we, we built that's salt weighted. Uh, the outer frame is 304, but that doesn't come in contact with salt uh, unless it's a, some sort of accident or emergency. So it doesn't have to last for long uh, because the salt would quickly cool down. Um, and um, of course, any you can put in components that are of different materials like cast alloy or some other steel that you wanted to test. Um, and the, the whole internal parts can also be made out of uh, some other thing than stainless steel. But what we found when we look for prices for building uh, the internal parts out of a Hastelloy or Inconel is that the price goes up by a, a big factor. So for the purposes of what we're doing, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us, at least uh, for our systems to use anything other than stainless steel, because that's what's readily available and uh, quick and easy to get stuff manufactured in. Um, and normally we're testing these systems for uh, days, weeks, um, uh, or months. So it's uh, on that time scale, it doesn't have to be Hestelloy. Uh, maybe when we build a reactor, we'll, we'll get to the point where it becomes necessary, but we're hoping that, that we can actually build a reactor that can last five years with uh, just stainless steel 316. Yeah. So I think if we go to the last slide, um, I think what we'll do now is that we will, um, uh, just uh, uh, wrap it, and then uh, we do have some some few uh, more questions that we can take them. But I guess if, if somebody needs to leave, then uh, we will. Uh, so we'll just answer them on the back, and those who have time can hang on and, and get the last uh, answers. But but uh, to say um, 
So, so the cost on these loops are approximately on a standard configuration, 100,000 US. Um, and um, if you have uh, any further questions, uh, feel free to uh, mail us here. Uh, so, so we'll be happy to, um, to respond. And uh, we also appreciate any feedback. So if there are any topics that we didn't manage to cover today, uh, we'll be happy for your input so we can incorporate that uh, another time. Um, so, so thank you all for, for participating. And uh, then I guess for those who still have time, we can just take the remaining um, uh, questions. So uh, there was one question here um, asking, uh, what is the longest time you have continuously run the or end the loop for? I've, we are in the months range, but uh, not continuously pumping. Uh, so right now we're sort of uh, trying to set up uh, multiple of these loops and we're hoping to run one of them for um, uh, a year straight, but that's not something we've done yet. Um, and that's because uh, building loops and operating loops is uh, surprisingly difficult. When we started, we thought it would be easy. Um, but of course we found along the way that um, uh, most things you need to design more than once and, and most things fail uh, at some point. So uh, getting everything, including all the operation and, and and software and everything to run for a year straight is a, is a big feat. But we also feel that when we get to that point, then uh, we're also well on our way to building molten salt reactors on an assembly line, uh, because that's it's all the same challenges that we're facing. Um, and having experience with the, with the, all the equipment and, and doing everything in-house helps a lot uh, in that regard. So we have a question here regarding Fleenac salt. <clears throat> so it says uh, Fleenac is quite a stable salt, but recent studies have shown they decompose into uh, metastable compounds, which can affect yield corrosion and operating operation times. Uh, do you account for that? Um, no, <laughs> no, it's not. Again, it's not an issue for the time scales that we are running at, um, and and. We don't plan to use Fleenac in the, uh, the reactor, at least not in the, for the fuel salt. Um, so if it becomes an issue, then we'll, we'll consider at that point sort of to change something. But again, if, if someone wanted to test a different salt, uh, there's no, no particular reason why you couldn't, as long as it can be contained in a standard steel or alloy, there, it's, uh, it's up for the picking. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, what is the amount of low, medium, and high radiation waste uh, kilo per megawatt? That's, that's what we have. It's mm -hmm. on the chat. What is the amount of, again? Uh, what is the amount of low, medium, and high radiation waste EQ uh, kilo per megawatt? I, I don't know that. Okay. <laughs> that, is, that is perhaps a little downstream. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have any of those calculations in front of me. Good. So, um, so I think that that pretty much yeah. uh, wraps it. Um, uh, I think we can. Yeah, people are free to contact us. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll we'll do the rest by by email. So, yeah. um, so thank you so much for your time, and um, feel free to reach out if you have any uh, questions or comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.